would like to continue this evening in our thinking regarding the providence of God. The intention will be to focus on the connection between the providence of God and faith. And we will spend time looking at the character Abraham. Our Bible character study has been intended to watch and learn from their relationship with God. We've spoken together in terms of spiritual integrity, spiritual integrity, the spiritual wholeness or integrity of the people that were studying, the people that God used, the people that walked with God and served God. We started with Adam. We wanted to establish the communion, the cooperation that took place in the garden before the fall, the relationship that Adam had with God, a walking together, a communing together. He and Eve served the Lord before the fall. We've moved forward through a number of Bible characters for the last few months and come to the character of Hezekiah. And as we came to Hezekiah, we came in the midst of or I might say in the midst of our study of Hezekiah, we are faced with this present challenge in our own lives and our own history. The development of this virus that has affected all of us, has taken thousands of lives, has brought to the surface what's going on, the rumblings of men's hearts. As we've observed, we recognize the challenges to our own lives as believers and the fact that the difficulty brings to the surface issues and areas that God would desire to address. There's a great need that we be honest, that we lay our hearts bare before the Lord, that we check our motivations before the Lord and think together in regards to whether or not we're living by faith, whether or not we're trusting God, whether or not we're living for those unseen things. As we followed out our studies, we came to a man named Enoch, chapter 5 and verse 24 of Genesis. The description of his life is that he walked with God. The Bible narrative gives that story, gives that statement in the midst of a record of those who were descendants. They were born and it keeps saying over and over again, and they died and they died, and they died. And it says, now Enoch walked with God and tells us that God received him to himself in the midst of a dying culture. There was a man who walked with God that God pointed out for us, much like he points to Job as a man unique and outstanding, a man of spiritual integrity. In the next chapter, we read of Noah. The Bible states that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, chapter 6 and verse number 8. And it says that in the midst of a culture where the imaginations of the thoughts of man was only evil continually. That's chapter 6 and verse number 5. We know of the flood in Noah's day and we know of how God prepared Noah and his family and how Noah, according to the New Testament, was a preacher of righteousness who stood out for that which was right, that which was pleasing to God, who gave announcements and warnings about the coming destruction. And God washed the earth clean and started over again with Noah and his family. Only a few chapters later, we come to Genesis 11, and we read of the Tower of Babel. It's a picture of many nations with one language. The Bible says in verse number 6 of Genesis 11, Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That's a statement regarding the impact of the fall. The impact of the fall, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Remember, chapter 6, it said in Noah's day, the imaginations of the hearts of man was only evil continually. And then at the Tower of Babel, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That's the impact of the fall. But that same record tells us of the involvement of God. 
the providence of God. God intervened. God overruled. And God divided the peoples by separating their languages. This is the history of humanity. It's a history of God's intervention and providential care. In chapter number 12, or at the end of chapter number 11, we see God moving from nations to a nation. God now is going to build a nation from one man named Abram. I would like to think with you about Abram or Abraham this evening in terms of the providence of God. We'll turn in the scriptures now to Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11, as I mentioned, is the end of the story after the Tower of Babel, the confusion of the languages. We have the descendants of Shem, and then we have the descendants of Terah, which brings us down to verse number 27. This is Genesis 11, if you would follow along, beginning in verse number 27. We read, now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Iscah. But it says in verse 30 and draws our attention here, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. Verse 31, and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. We have the introduction of Abram, and we have, beginning in verse number 12, God recording for us what he had said to Abram in advance of these things that we just read. It says in verse 1 of chapter 12, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. At this point in the history of humanity, we see the providence of God. And I want to think with you again and remind you again of what we're talking about. When we're talking about the providence of God. We're talking about God's influence, God's involvement, God's operation in and over the details of history. There are other ways to define providence, but for our clarity, at least for our understanding to this point, we're thinking in terms of God's influence, His providential care, God's involvement, sometimes overruling, always orchestrating His purposes, His care, and then God's operation what God does, how God turns hearts, how God leads men, how God uses nations, how God orchestrates history to work out his purposes, sometimes using the choices that men have made, sometimes overruling the choices that men have made, but always providentially caring. We talk about the divine providence. What are we talking about? We're talking about God's influence, God's involvement, and God's operation in and over the details of history. His plans and purposes, orchestrated and superintended. I think this is a helpful way as we read the narrative of the scripture, as we read the testimony, even of the Psalms, as God leads his people forward, as God intervenes, as we read through the book of Proverbs, and we see that the heart of the king is in his hand, and we see that when men are casting lots to make decisions, that God orchestrates and superintends his purposes that way. He will use a nation to 
chasten his people Israel, and then he will judge that nation for their evil or for going beyond what God had intended in regards to the punishment, the chastisement of his people. So it's his plans and purposes orchestrated and superintended. It involves man's intentions and choices, but those intentions and choices can be overruled, can even be undone. The evil that was intended at the crucifixion of Christ, as Peter's preaching, he says God was accomplishing his purposes, but he doesn't depreciate the reality that men were evil in what they were doing. Joseph says the same to his brothers in chapter 50 of Genesis that we have studied. Man's intentions and choices are overruled and undone as God advances his purposes and his plan. And then there is that ultimate rule of God and righteousness that has been promised and will be accomplished. We read the testimony in Genesis 3 that God would intervene and deal with the impact of the fall, the death, the guilt, the shame. We read in Genesis chapter 6 that God cleansed the earth of wickedness and continue to advance his purposes through one man and his family. We turn to Genesis 11 and 12 and we see again that God moves away from the nations as a whole and communicates his intention to build a nation from one man and to accomplish his saving purposes through that man and those that nation. We watch history unfold through the Bible. We watch it unfold in post-Bible times. And we watch as we read the book of Revelation presently. And we see that God is ultimately going to rule in righteousness. And that is a promise that he has made. And that is what he will accomplish. The ultimate rule involves the reality that the enemies of God, the enemies of God will perish. The enemies of God are condemned already. To be an enemy of God is to anticipate ultimate separation from God. The enemies of God will perish. We're also reminded that the saving purposes of God will prevail. Not only will the enemies of God perish, but the saving purposes of God will prevail. Not only will the enemies of God perish and the saving purposes of God prevail, but the believing will participate in glory and worship forever. The believing will participate in glory and worship forever. To speak of the providence of God is to talk about history. It's to talk about prophecy. It's to talk about individuals and nations and their experience in the midst of history, in the midst of God's prophecy. The providence of God, we have learned, has to do with God seeing before and providing before and guiding before. I do not believe this could be overemphasized. I think where we live right now is one of those opportunities to magnify the reality that God saw all of this. God provided for all of this. God is guiding all of this. It talks about it. the divine providence thinks about, talks about what God knows, which is everything. It has to do with what God pur purposes, what he provides for. It has to do with what he accomplishes. This is a reassuring reference point in life for believing people. What we're talking about is the character of God. What we're thinking about is the character of God and our need to have a faith response to his character. This is biblically how believers live. Believers live being exposed to the character of God and expressing faith in his character. We live in the reality of that which is we live in the reality of that which is unseen
what we see and what we experience tends to cloud out that which is unseen. But people of faith are reassured and use as their reference point for life the character of God, what God sees before and provides before and guides before. That is reassuring. Looking back now to those first verses of chapter 12 of Genesis, let's think about this in the life of Abram, later called Abraham. It says in verse 1 of chapter 12, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We see, first of all, the initiative of God. This is what is known as God's call on Abram's life. God's promise in advance as to what he was going to do. Acts chapter 7 and verse 2, during Stephen's message, he says that God called Abraham when he was still in Mesopotamia. Before this move that is talked about in the end of chapter 11 took place, God called Abram. He initiated this call and he says, I will do this. Now he says that to a man whose wife is barren. The biblical record tells us in the end of chapter 11 of Genesis that Sarai is barren. So God makes this kind of promise to a man whose wife is barren. He makes this promise to a man who is dust and will prove it time and time again. Abraham proves time and time again that he is a fallen man. He fails the Lord, and yet because of God's providence, his failure is not the undoing of what God is doing. The initiative is of God. His sovereign purposes and his providential care are clear in the story of Abram. He knows, he provides, he designs, he guides. Participation in God's purposes begins with God. This is the starting point for all of us. Is the all-knowing, almighty God. Whether it be creation or his covenant promises, we live our lives based upon the commands and promises of God. We get up another day and we are reminded of the sovereign rule of God. The scriptures speak in terms of determinate counsel and foreknowledge in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23 when it talks about the cross, the crucifixion of Christ. Determinate counsel and foreknowledge. That is God's sovereign rule. And there is mystery there. There's that perfect tension as men talk about that nice edge of theology, that mystery of how God's sovereignty and man's will, volition works. And it. all of us at some point will have to leave off and say, that's beyond our understanding. But what is very clear, what is restated and reemphasized throughout the scripture, what we see here in the story of Abram is the initiative of God. Participation in God's purposes begins with God. Let's follow it out, verses 4 through 6 of Genesis 12. So, Abram departed. So, God has spoken, God has called him, and now Abram responds in faith. He departed. Listen, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot, who was introduced earlier, went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, that would be the servants of the household, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. They're headed to Canaan, just as God told them to, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram 
passed through the land into the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moray, and the Canaanite was in the land. Participation in God's purposes begins with God, but secondly, participation in God's purposes involves man. As the writer tells the story, it says, here's what God said to Abraham. And then he said, this is what Abraham did. He moved to the promised land. He took God at his word. He was commanded by God and promised by God. And he participated with God by making choices of obeying and going out, not knowing, not knowing where he was going. If you'd save your place there in Genesis 12 and turn back to Hebrews 11. When you turn to Hebrews 11, you'll be reminded that this is the chapter that talks about faith. It's the chapter that gives us illustration after illustration of people who have walked by faith, who have participated in God's purposes. I'm in Hebrews chapter number 11, beginning our reading in verse number 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, think about this in Abram's story. The substance of things hoped for. Confidence. It's confidence in reference to things that are hoped for. Secondly, it's the evidence of things not seen. It's the proof or the conviction or the assurance in reference to things not seen as yet. The testimony of Abraham's faith is that he went out to a place he didn't know about, that he couldn't see. But let's go on in verse number two. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Well, through faith, this is foundational, fundamental. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So the writer puts the emphasis on the word of God, the word of God. By faith, verse number four, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead yet speaketh. So what happened there? Well, Abel did what the word of God told him to do, and Cain didn't. So by the word of God, the worlds were framed. So the things which we can see after hearing about things hoped for and things not seen in verses 1, we read about the things that are seen in verse number 3. And those things that are seen were framed by the word of God. Abel took God at his word and offered a more sac excellent sacrifice than Cain. What about Enoch? Verse number five, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. In the midst of, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. It says Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hebrews writes it this way, was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Well, how did he please God? He pleased God by taking God at his word. He pleased God by making decisions, by making choices in alignment with what God had revealed pleases him. Then it turns in verse 6 and says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. It doesn't say it's impossible to please God. It says without faith. It's impossible to please God. And then it goes on, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah turns now to Noah, being warned of God, again, the word of God coming to Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. He reverenced God and did what God said. He participated in God's purposes. By making choices, what did he do? Verse 7 says he prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And then we move to this character that we're studying about by faith. Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out to 
not knowing whither he went. We have the testimony of the writer of Hebrews that reaches back to Genesis chapter 11 and 12, reminds us of this man, Abram. He was called by God. God made promises to him. He participated by obeying and going out, not knowing where he went. So you have here, in the initiative of God, you have a command from God, and you have an obedient participant. Faith is not a work. It's not a work. And it's very important that we establish this and maintain this. The Bible teaches us that faith is not a work, but rather a yielding. Let's turn now to Romans chapter 4. I believe in our faith walk, we must have this established. We must understand that faith is not a work. It's rather a yielding. The writer of Romans, Paul, as he writes of salvation, as he writes of the mercy of God, brings Abraham before us. And we cannot read the entire passage, but I want to read a portion of it to establish for us the statement that I've just made. Faith is not a work, but rather a yielding. Say, so how do we know that? Because the scripture teaches that. So any idea that makes faith a work misrepresents what the scripture says. Look at the first five verses of chapter four of Romans. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. There's faith. He trusted God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, again, putting works in contrast to faith, his faith is counted for righteousness. He is declared righteous. Drop down to verse 17, please. This is verse 17 of Romans 4. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. That's the promise we read back in chapter 12 of Genesis. Before him whom he he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, this is Abram, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. Again, refers back to God's word, God's promises, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, that is what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed or credited to him for righteousness. Let's turn to another passage, Galatians chapter number three. If we do not establish and maintain our understanding in regards to faith, we become confused. We end up with wrong thinking about our relationship with God. We begin to put an emphasis upon what we're doing. We begin to believe that what we have failed to do somehow changes our relationship with God. Well, the book of Galatians addresses this because there were a people at Galatia who had come to Christ and yet were floundering because they were confused. They were confusing faith and works. And so... And Paul is rather direct in this letter. And in chapter three, we begin with these words, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you 
that you should not obey the truth. Okay, obedience to the truth is what is being called for here. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, he reasons with them, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law. Okay, there's your works in contrast to, or by the hearing of faith, one or the other. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that is, the hearing of faith, are you now made perfect by the flesh, that is, verse 2, the works of the law? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He that, he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Verse 6, we have Abraham brought before us in this letter. Even as Abraham, what did he do? He believed God. And it was accounted or credited to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, how? Through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live, how? By faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And he goes back to Abraham again in verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. How? Through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith. Again, said in contrast to works, brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. 4, verse 18, if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham, how? by promise. Listen, faith is not a work, but rather a yielding. The power of faith in Abraham's life is that he was commanded by God and he was promised by God. And he obeyed the command while trusting the promise. He obeyed the command while trusting the promise. He was a man of confidence and a man of conviction because he embraced the command of God and the promise of God. The scriptures make it abundantly clear that faith is not works. Works is rather a yielding uh, uh, that obeys. James talks about faith without works, but he does not do so in confusion of faith and works. He makes clear that works are a result of our faith. Obedience to God's commands while trusting in his promises, taking God at his word, taking God at his word while unable to see the details. Faith is not a work, but rather a yielding. Secondly, faith is not a merit, but rather a receiving. Clearly, Abraham took God at his word. 
emphasized in the Genesis story, emphasized in Romans, emphasized in Galatians. He left his home country. He undertook a journey of unknown length, of difficulty, of danger, towards a country that he knew nothing about, but that he had been promised to be his and his offsprings by God. He proceeded in the direction which the divine call pointed out, and he went onward until that same divine call directed him to stop. He did not himself receive the promise. It was nearly five centuries later before his offspring inherited the land. He was a pilgrim and a sojourner. He had left one land and was on the way to another land. We can see that back in Hebrews. Let's go back there for just a moment. Then we'll return to Genesis. Hebrews chapter 11. Let me follow through with you in what the writer communicates about Abram, Abraham. We're going to pick up our reading now in verse number 9. We read in verse number 8 of Hebrews 11. He obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. Verse number 9 says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And verse number 10 helps us to understand the emphasis here. He's a sojourner. He's a pilgrim. He's on the way. Verse 10, he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What is that? That's the unseen dwelling place of God, the unseen preparation of God. What is that talking about? Well, we drop down a few verses and we see the answer to that. Look at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. There's the faith and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is, here's the answer to the question of what is it talking about when it talks about this city which hath no foundations, who or which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God in verse 10. They desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he hath prepared for them a city. That is the promise of God, that eternal dwelling place, that heaven, that heavenly home, that ultimate land of promise that God has promised to believers. So, Bringing this forward to where we live today and understanding where we are in the eternal purposes of God, we're thinking about the providence of God. And we're being reminded of the initiative of God as we watch the story of Abraham. Participation in God's purposes begins with God and participation in God's purposes involves man. Faith is not a work but rather a yielding. And faith is not a merit, but rather a receiving, a participation in the purposes of God, a privileged participation in the purposes of God. Let's think for a moment about the involvement of man. What about our place of hearing from God and obeying God and living our lives based upon the promises of God? That is those unseen things, those things that we have not realized, but we are convinced are ours because we're taking God at his word. Well, the involvement of man, first of all, the unknowns are always a challenging factor for us. How will God do what God has promised to do? Now, Abraham's journey of faith involved individuals, it involved events, it involved timing, it involved circumstances, it involved some wrong choices. It involves some rescues, it involves some interruptions, it involves some adjustments, not unlike our own lives. Our own lives involves individuals and events and timing and circumstances and at times wrong choices. It also involves rescues and interventions and interruptions and adjustments. 
For Abraham, he had to deal, first of all, with himself, as do we. Then there was Sarai. And then there was Hagar. Then there was Ishmael. Abraham's story involves Pharaoh and Lot and Abimelech, Melchizedek. His story involves famines. His story involves Sodom and Gomorrah. It involves angelic visitors. It also involves repeatedly the covenant promises of God. Time and time again, God reminded him of the promise that he had made. That heaven is not just a destination. It is a motivation. That city that God has built, that has foundations that are eternal, is not only a destination, it is a motivation because there's so many unknowns. And those unknowns are a challenging factor. And every time we drill down and try to figure out the unknowns, we find ourselves in trouble. How's God going to work out his purposes right now in our world? How is all this going to turn out? How is all this going to work? We don't know. But we do know where everything's going. How long will we live on this earth? We don't know. But we do know what God has promised. The unknowns are always a challenging factor. But the known, on the other hand, is always the anchor and the motivator. We cannot spend our lives focusing upon what we don't know. We must build our lives and live our lives based upon what we do know. The unknown can be overwhelming. The unknown is for us guesswork. It's not unknown to God. It's just unknown to us. So Abraham's going to a city that God knows about that he doesn't know about. He's going to a land that God knows about. He's embracing a promise that only God knows how he's going to work that out. And the test and the challenges are very real. I'd like to pick that story up. Would you turn back with me again to the book of Genesis? Why does God give us these stories? Because these are real life characters who live by faith. These are characters who are involved in the providential purposes of God. They dealt with the same things we deal with. And they had to deal with the unknowns and that challenged them. But God kept reminding them of things that were settled. I'd like to direct our attention now to chapter 12 of Genesis and verse number 7. And I want to read through portions of this story because the Word of God is alive. We don't apologize for reading the Word of God because the Word of God is alive. It tells the story. And sometimes we just need to put the pieces of the story together. Let's put some of those pieces together. Verse 7 of Genesis 12. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed, he says it again, doesn't he? Will I give this land? There built and he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. He worshiped God. Verse 8 says, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel in the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward south. He's on the move. He's obeying. God's moving him forward. But I want you to notice the things that are repeated to Abram are things that are known, things that are settled, things that are promised. Look at it in the first four verses of chapter 13. This is Genesis 13, verse number one. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, and between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And again, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. What is he doing? He's coming back to the Lord time and time again. What is his reference point as he is a sojourner and pilgrim? His reference point is the Lord. His reference point is that which is known. Look later in verse 14 of chapter 13. 
Genesis 13, 14. And the Lord said unto Abram after that lot had, was separated from him, Lift thou thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Rise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Promise, 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 promise. Verse 18, Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and notice again, built there an altar unto the Lord. The reference point for Abram time and time again is the God who has made these promises. What keeps motivating him? What keeps moving him forward? What is his anchor and motivator if it's not the very promises of God made to him? End of chapter 14, please. Genesis 14 and verse 21. This is after Abram rescues Lot and is blessed by Melchizedek. And it says in verse 21 of Genesis 14, the king of Sodom, in his appreciation here, said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Listen to Abram. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet. And that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me. Let them take their portion. Here's the testimony of Abram's heart again, that he is looking to the Lord and depending on the Lord for every provision. Pick it up in verse number one of chapter 15, please. It's telling us the story, and then it says in verse 15, or verse 1 of chapter 15, after these things, again, the word, the word of the Lord, came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, there's your anchor, and thy exceeding great reward, that motivation. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Is, is the blessing going to come through this servant, this steward in my house? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. What about the promise? And lo, one born in my house is mine heir, Eliezer. Behold, verse 4 says, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. It's going to be your own biological son. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look, look toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Notice verse number six, and he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. That same text that's quoted in Romans 4, 3, and Genesis, or Galatians chapter 3, and verse number six. Testimony after testimony of God's promise and what God is doing. Verse 18, come to the end of chapter 15, please, with me, and look at verse number 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Listen to the, how many times this promise is repeated. The unseen thing. In the same day, the Lord made covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphim and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. All of this is what I promised to you. Chapter 17. Chapter 17 and verse number 1, when Abram was 90 years old. And 9. So now he's 99. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God. Again, this testimony of the God that has made this promise. Walk before me and be thou perfect. 
Verse number two of chapter 17, I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Promise, 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 and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Verse five, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham shall be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee and I will make thee exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in these generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And at this point, you and I are saying, well, how many times does God have to say this to Abram? Well, let me remind us that that's the way we see things working in the scripture. Wouldn't it be wonderful if God could say things to us one time and we would by faith embrace what God said and that would be it for us. But you know what? That's not it for us. It's not that the repetition is unnecessary. It is that the repetition is necessary. It's not that we know these things so well that we don't need to hear them again. It is that we don't know these things so well that we need to hear them again. And there is a rhythm of testimony as to the character of God, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, the attributes of God are brought before us. The covenant of God is brought before us time and time and time and time and time again so that we might express, express fresh faith, active, durative faith in our God. We need to understand this. Some professing believers have a intellectual relationship with God. They think they know a fact, they've got it. That is not spiritual life. Spiritual life has to do with a heart that's engaged with God embracing time and time again what he says to us as he repeats to us over and over and over and over again the same fundamental truths. It's not that we get it and can move on. It's that we don't get it and it is not transformative in our lives. And our life is filled with reminders from God repeatedly saying the same thing over and over again and calling us to a faith response. What a vivid testimony of that in the life of Abraham. Chapter 18, and verse number 14. This is where the promise is made again. The three angelic visitors are there. In verse 14, we see this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? We got the word of the Lord and the promise of the Lord, and we got doubt and Abraham and Sarah's part. Uh, Sarah's laughing at the very thought of having a child. And the response is, is anything too hard for the Lord? Verse 14. Listen, at the time appointed, I will return to thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Down in verse 25. This is chapter 18, verse 25. Abraham here is interceding for Sodom and look at his reference point. Verse 25, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. He's talking to the Lord and then he raises this question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. Always. There's the anchor. There's the motivator. The unknowns are always a challenging factor, but the known is always the anchor and motivator. Yes, the God, the judge of all the earth will do what is right. Let's go to the final test for Abraham, and that's over in chapter 22. 
chapter 22, as God builds Abraham's faith, as God teaches us about faith, as God works out his purposes providentially in this man's life through twists and turns and various challenges, we come to chapter 22 and we read something that had to be profound, profoundly alarming for Abram. Notice, it came to pass after these things, after all these things we've been reading about and talking about, that God did tempt or test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, that's the son of promise, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will ter tell thee of. Striking how little is said here. It simply says in verse 3, And Abraham, here's the faith, here's the confidence in God, here's the belief and convincement of things hoped for, not seen. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and claved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to, unto you. The New Testament tells us he believed the Lord was going to resurrect his son after this sacrifice. He took God at his promise. We will come again to you, it says in the end of verse 5. And Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. And they came to the place where God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Here's the test, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me, that son of promise. Everything Abraham lived for is wrapped up in that son. Abraham, verse 13, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. This is all based upon the promises of God. The promises of the God who knows how he will accomplish his purposes and is able to do so amidst all the twists and turns and uncertainties of this earth side life. Faith settles the believing amidst turbulence and uncertainty. Let this be applied to our lives today. Faith settles the believing. We trust the promises of God as we obey the commands of God. Faith settles the believing amidst turbulence and uncertainty. And secondly, faith enables the believer to obey and advance. That is the power of faith in perilous times. The power of faith in perilous times is it enables the believer to obey and to advance. No matter what the season might be, no matter what the details might be, there's an anchor to the God of the Scripture, the God who has promised us that we will live with Him forever, has promised us what he is doing and accomplishing. And our place is not to figure out all of the details of this life, but to anchor to that which is known, that which is true. Let's pray to, together. Father, thank you. Thank you for...
not only teaching us about your character, straightforward testimonies as to who you are, but Father, giving us stories of other people, stories of men like Abram, Abraham, Father, who become those New Testament reference points for faith and trust, those arguing points against the idea that our relationship with you is based upon our works and what we've accomplished rather than your grace. We praise you for your providential care and we ask that as we've studied this topic for a number of weeks that these things would would sink sink down into our souls that we'd latch on to these things father not in in mere intellect but father and not mere curiosity but father in in life-giving nourishment to our souls day in and day out may we build our lives on the promises of our god and live out our lives in obedience to your commands help us we pray in Christ's name, amen.